Well, good morning, everyone. Hope you've had a good couple days since I've last seen you. A little bit interesting weather out there, but I'm glad you could make it out this morning. We have a lot of uh, important things to talk about in our time together today, and my hope is that we will be set up for uh, me to be able to give you your next homework assignment at the end of class today. So uh, with that in mind, we definitely want to try and move expeditiously through our content but before we do jump in um, any questions that you might have or other things that would be helpful for us to talk about here at the start of class all right well we are talking about uh, ABAP database interaction and during our class time last week or earlier this week um, I showed you how to go into the ABOP dictionary and create a database table. That is something that you'll have to do for the sake of your next homework assignment. And then we started talking about the topic of uh, working with database tables in our ABOP programming. And we were, uh, we talked about the fact that in ABOP we use a variant of the SQL uh, standard, the SQL language called OpenSQL, which has a few uh, syntactical uh, elements of distinctness versus other variants of SQL that you might have used previously. We pretty much focus on four SQL statements, uh, select, update, insert, and delete. And when we were together last time, we had started looking at the select statement. And uh, I think we, we covered a couple slides past this, but I'll, I'll pick up here. This is an example of um, a ABOP program that employs OpenSQL to pull information from a database table and then display it on the screen. And I've, I've moved that same code into our editor here. And so um, let's talk about this code a little bit because I'm going to show you some new techniques today that we can use in our programming that will be really powerful extensions and actually allow us to shorten the length of the code that we have to write. So um, let's talk about line eight for a moment. Who, who can tell us in, in English um, what, what is line eight doing? Okay, it's creating what kind of table? SPFLI which is made from the uh, uh, dictionary. Okay, so let's back up then. What kind of table is SPFLI? It's a database table. Okay, but what is so? What is line eight doing? In, internal. It's okay. Internal table. It's creating an internal table that matches the structure of the database table SPFLI. Okay, so that means if SPFly had 87 fields in it, ITAP now has 87 fields available in it. And so one of the things that we observed previously is we can write code like line 8 if, as we look at a database table, we see that we're using either the entirety of that database table structure or the majority of it. So let's say, for example, if SPFly did have 87 records in it, and you were going to, and I said records, I mean fields, it had 87 fields in it, and let's say in your program, you were later going to use 85 of those 87 fields. Well, I feel pretty good about line eight as it stands, because that's, that's pretty efficient use of memory. But, if SPFly had 87 fields, and in our program we were using three of those fields, then line 8 is not a very good line of code because we're not going to be very efficiently using uh, the resources that are available to us. So when we have seen this situation, table with 87 fields in the database, but we plan on only using three of them, what have we done in the past to compensate for that? 
created a structure. Created a structure. Defined a structure that would list the three fields that we're interested in, and we would use the data type being reflective of the data types of the field in the table, and you've done that in, in homework assignments, and so you, you've seen that. So we, to this point, we've observed that we kind of have two choices here. If we're going to use the whole or most of a database table in our inner workings of our program, then it's okay to create an, uh, an internal table that matches the structure of that database table. But we've also observed if we don't need all of the fields, then um, creating our own structure and basing the table off of that is, is the way we'd want to go. I want to point out one other thing about this sample program right here that is unusual and done just strictly for the sake of this particular demo. I am actually retrieving the MONT field and writing it to output. We usually do not do that. Okay? I'm just doing that here for the sake of this particular example. But let's understand what's going to happen here. Um, if I have logged into, I think we're using, what is it, client number 413 this semester. When I run this program, uh, we're going to see 413 written out to the left of all of those lines. What we have not talked about, and we'll come back to a little bit later in our discussion today, is something that relates to the way ABOP interacts with the database. And in fact, line 11 is a select statement. Line 11 and line 12 are a select statement. You'll notice there's, there's no where clause. Well, there is in every ABOP query an implied where clause that looks like this, where mont equals sy dash mont. That is implied in every ABOP query unless we do away with it using a syntax I'll show you a little bit later in our discussion today. Now, what does this effectively do in, in the query? How would you explain what that's doing in, in English? making sure that you're only getting the data for that specific client. Okay, this right here, we know, is, is dynamic. It's a dynamic system object that's reflective of the client that I've logged into. So in the case of our running this query, this is saying where mod equals 413. Now, what you have to understand is if we were to look in the database table, and find the Mont field. We might find that there are 8,000 records in this table. And we might find that 50 of those records are for Mont 412, and 75 of them are for Mont 413, and, and there might be 10 or 20 different clients in this table. But when I execute a select statement, I will only get back the records for the client that I am logged into because this is added as an implied part of every, of every query we write. I'll show you a little bit later how to undo that if we want to, but this is part of the inherent security model, part of the inherent data integrity of the system. And so that's why when we create a database table, we will, unless you can give me a really good reason not to, we will always put a mod field there. And so that is, in this program, I'm explicitly retrieving it and showing it on the screen. Usually you don't do that, but what I'm telling you is even if I deleted references to mod throughout this entire program, the where mod equals sy mod is an implied part of this particular query. Questions about that? If you um, defined your own, like if you wrote where mod equals like 200, would it override that? Um, I will show you syntax to override it a little bit later, but unless you use that specific syntax, no. 
that was it, it, it would probably I don't know whether we'll play around with it a little bit later when I show you the other syntax I don't know if it would ignore it we were have we'll have to find the table that has multiple clients in it and we'll play around with that a little bit okay and is select the only one of the four basic um, SQL statements that has that inherently in it? select is the only one that has this particular syntax, but when I insert, I'm gonna pick up inserting the current client number automatically. So it is, it has, um, it's implied in other statements we will write as well, okay? All right, so here's a new piece of syntax that was just added to ABOP in I believe it was two revisions of the language ago, and it's a really, really nice new feature. And so this is where we will pick up with today. Um, as of NetWeaver 7.4, and, and SAP almost every year comes up with updates to the ABAP language, where they implement things that developers have requested, they update the syntax. And remember, one of the things we observed before is old syntax continues to work. SAP will just declare it obsolete or deprecated, but they never want to break programs that are actually running in a productive environment. So they never do away with anything totally. They just add new stuff on top. And so this is an example of that. But what you will see is that in a lot of instances, when you write a program that uses the new syntax, it will disallow some elements of the old syntax. And you'll get errors when you try and activate or when you do a syntax check of the program. The idea being that SAP says if you want to run the old syntax, you can run the old syntax. But as soon as you start writing programs with the new syntax, in that particular program, you can't mix the old and, and the new. What I'm going to show you is one of the new features is something called an inline declaration. Inline declarations allow data objects to be created as needed with type inference. So, let's assume that we have written a one-line ABAP program. This is the whole program. There's no code before this other than the, the report header line. So you'll notice a couple of things here. We have the keyword data. Immediately after the keyword data with no space, we have an opening parenthesis. And then within those parentheses, once again, no spaces. That's kind of unique. Previously, when we've used parentheses, there's had to be spaces. We have uh, a variable name. And based on what I just told you, there's no code before this that declared my var or defined what type it is. This is an inline declaration. And what's going to happen here is the system is going to look at the context of this line of code and say, okay, seven and two are both of type i for integer. So if I'm adding together two integers, I'm going to put that into an integer. So my var is created, set to type i, and this math is done, and my var is set to the value 9. So what inline, what inline declarations allow us to do is start using a data object and have the system figure out the typing for us so that we don't have to write all the code to do that in advance. Now, in the context of this line of code that I'm showing you here, it's, it's not really all that impressive. I mean, my var can be created with, West, with just one line of code. But we're going to see we can use these inline declarations with our SQL stuff. Now, here's some rules, though. If we use this new syntax, if we use the inline data declaration, then any variables in our SQL statement have to have an at sign put in front of them. If we're using the old syntax, we don't do that. 
And in fact, to do that would generate a syntax error. But if we're going to use an inline data declaration in an SQL statement, we have to put an at symbol in front of any variables and field names have to be separated by commas. What do I mean by that? Well, I trust you notice this, but uh, in this code right here, in my select statement, there's no commas between the names of the field. But if I move to the new inline declaration, then that changes. And I have to put commas there, okay? So, so let's actually look at this in action. That's an entire program from start to finish. So you'll notice I start right away on line one with a select statement, select mod, and this is designed to mimic the program we were just looking at. Select mod, carrot, con it, city from, city to, from SP fly into table at data ITAP. So what has happened right here is the system has looked at this and said, oh, you're using the syntax into table. So into table tells me you're putting this into an internal table. And then it looks at this and says, okay, you're going to call that internal table ITAP. Oh, and you're referencing a database table, and you're referencing those five fields from that database table, so I'll make your internal table have those five fields and match up the data types for you automatically. So, if we go back to what I put here on the whiteboard a moment ago, before, if we had a database table with 87 fields and we only wanted to use 3 or 13 of those fields, we would have had to create a structure and then use that structure in the definition of our database table, or excuse me, of our internal table. No more. We could just write a select statement, select, list the names of the fields we wanted to retrieve from, list the name of the database table, and then use the new inline dynamic syntax here and have it create the internal table automatically. Well then beyond that, I need a work area. Well, I could use our old syntax for creating a work area, but I'm going to embrace the new option here, and my work area gets created in my loop at statement. Loop at itab into, so the system knows based on this context, oh, if I loop across an internal table, I'm going to be pulling off a single record, I'm going to be pulling off something that represents a row, I'm going to be pulling off a work area, so this right here says, Okay, system, just create me a work area based on the structure that, that you know already exists. So what I have done is I can greatly reduce the amount of code that I have to do by pushing this work onto the, the system. Now we'll play around with this a little bit, but, but any questions about this? Is that a standard internal table? Yes, now that's, that's the other trade-off here. That is a standard internal table. I have no way of making it to be anything else other than reverting to the old syntax. If I wanted this to be a sorted table, I would have to explicitly declare it. Now, it may well be that in future updates, SAP gives us some syntax to change that up, but right now, this is just going into a standard table. Good question. Yes, sir. If you made a if you made a sorted table before and, and did not make a work area beforehand, would that work area? Yes. Work you area? could you could then you know that we're using these in the same program, but these are not inherently connected. Okay. So yeah, if we could we could define our our sort, sorted table, but then not create the work area until I actually needed it, as as we're seeing here. So, just so we, um, we get the hang of this uh, and understand what, what, we're, what I want to do here is, so here's, here's the old program that we, we demoed just a moment ago. So, what this allows us to do is we can delete these two lines right here. We don't even need them anymore. We don't have to pre-declare iTable or iTab. We don't have to pre-create the, the, the work area, but... We have to go in now and change up the syntax. We have to put 
commas between all of these field names. Now notice just a couple things. If I save this now and I do a syntax check, it's going to probably complain about a lot of things. Um, let's see what specifically it says. Uh, seven syntax errors. If new open SQL syntax is used, it must be used throughout. This includes using at to escape host variables. I mean, so this is pretty a pretty good error message to describe what I indicated. And so now I have to look at this and say, well, well, which of these are are variables? And it's my internal table is a variable there. So, uh, you know, you would think, well, I could just do this, but the new syntax requires, since this is the creation of that internal table, I put the at symbol and then put data around it. And so now, that is going to pass syntax check. I still have a problem later on in my code, but at least as far as my select statement goes, um, I think we should be good here. And so now, um, oh, I did not mention this. This is coming up on another slide, but this is as good a place as any. Inline data declarations cannot be used together with into corresponding. I don't need into corresponding fields of anymore um, because the system's managing that for me. So, you know, it, it, it's kind of redundant for me to put that there. So I get rid of that. And so we'll save and we'll do another. Um, check here and now now it's it's fine with the select statement but it's confused about line 11 because it doesn't know what wa is because i got rid of that de declaration so here i'm not in an open sql statement so i don't need the at symbol but i do need the keyword data get my caps lock key working right here and my fingers working right and then I put the name WA inside of that and so we'll save this and I'm pretty sure we're we're all good here so I'll just move to activate and then we'll run and and there's my program behaving as expected so the the really nice thing about this is is if I wanted to at this point for example get rid of the con ed field well, I could edit the con ed field out of here. I could edit the con ed field out of here. And that's all I have to do. I'm not going to have to change the definition of my structure. Um, this will work for me just fine. So what this opens up for me now is some really nice options. For example, um, let's say I wanted to work with another database table. I don't know if I've shown you this trick before, but let's say I'm writing a program and I want to use a, a table out there called Mara. Mara is a huge table. It is one of the table that stores, um, that stores material information. So I'm just going to uh, type in Mara here. I'm obviously going to change these, so I'll go ahead and, and delete those. But if I want to see what's in Mara, I could just double click on this and it'll automatically open the um, ABOP dictionary and navigate to that table for me. We see that Mara has 256 fields. So this is a good example of a table that if I were only going to use four of these fields, I wouldn't want to use the old syntax and create an internal table that mirrored this because I'd be using four fields and leaving 252 fields totally blank, and that's no good. Um, there's a lot of information in this table. Um, let's just pick out a couple of fields to incorporate into our program. And by the way, someone's asked me before, I don't think it's come up this semester, these fields over here on the right or on the left, is there any way to like tell the system to display them to you in alphabetic order? and there's not. You get the inherent order of whoever created this database table. So it's sometimes annoying to have to do like we're doing here and scroll through the fields. And I'll just tell you that a lot of times the easier way to do this is to Google SAP Mara table. And, or did I, and Google will show a web page that lists all of this information for you. But I happen to know 
there's a field called MATNR, which is material number. So we'll go ahead and use that in our program. So what I can do here, whoops, hit that once too often, very easily, is, is essentially use the same syntax and change very little of our program. I can just now say select M-A-T-N-R and, and let me just show you the what I suggested a moment ago as the way to do this. Um, if I get Google up here, SAP Mara table. And so you know, here's a web page that, that shows you all the different fields and, and there are others that do a little bit better job than this even, but let's pick out a couple of fields that might be interesting here. Um, oh, you can see this is just a huge tape. I love this one, pilferable. Um, I guess this is whether or not the item can be stolen or not. Um, I guess the implication that you could steal a wrench, but you probably can't steal like a printing press. And so you have that for materials. Um, and so, um, I don't know. We'll do um, MCOND, which may in fact be null in our database table, but we'll just pick it here. So what I can do here is, is I can do this. That's all I have to change on, on line eight. And then all I have to do down here is change this to M-A-T-N-R and MCOND. Get rid of these items that we're no longer using. And so now we have, if you will, a pattern for uh, pulling things out of any database table and displaying it, and, and it turns out I have material numbers, but I don't have uh, MCON. That particular field is null in our, in our table here. So any questions about this? All right, so let's go back to what I was talking about with the Mont field. Most system tables have a Mont field that designates the client number. OpenSQL commands by default are done for the current client only. To override this behavior, we add the client specified clause to the command. And what this does is allows us to specify a client number or if I don't specify a client number, I get back all of the clients in a WHERE clause. If client specified is used but no client limiting code is included, I get back all the clients. So I'll show you how this works. This is not a technique that we would use with, with great frequency, but here's an example. I'm using the same um, new syntax as a moment ago. Looks like we didn't get the last line of code here. So notice I've changed my select statement now and added client specified. So let's see if in fact um, this changes anything. Since I've gotten rid of my old code, let me just paste this new code into the ABAP editor and we'll look at it here. Uh, looks like I didn't pick up any odd characters, so that's good. So, look at this. Remember, my leftmost column is my client number. Client zero has a whole bunch of rows associated with it. Client 401 has a whole bunch of records associated with it. And in fact, if we keep scrolling here, um, 401, 403, 412, 406, 408, you can see all of that information. And, and I guess just to, um, just to emphasize this, do you remember um, what was the uh, system variable I could use to 
um, find out how many how many records were just manipulated by an open SQL statement? What's that? SY is right, but not not index. Index we use in a loop. SY DB count. And I should have typed that in all caps. So I'm not going to put anything fancy with that as far as other ancillary explaining text or whatever, but now my output at the top is going to tell me how many records it retrieved, and it retrieved 495. Okay. Yes, sir. So basically when it's client specific, it's kind of like the client number that's accessed into the SAP system. Yeah, normally it pulls from my login the data that is associated with that client. This gives us a way to step around that. And so, in fact, what I could do here, and, and once again, you, you, you would almost never need or want to do this, um, but I could add a where clause here where uh, MANDT equals triple zero. Okay, and so now in this situation, um, because I have used the client specified syntax, I'm only getting back client triple zero, which is not the client I'm logged into. I'm logged into, well, I don't have it up down here, I'm logged into client 413. Okay. So if I put that client specified syntax in there, I get back all of the records, or in this case, I get back the one that I've limited to. But if I get rid of client specified and just try and do it like so, we should find that this generates, yep, a error, and uh, it actually gave me seven errors, uh, of which one of them is going to be complained about the client mont cannot be specified in the where conditioning client handling is performed by the compiler so unless I add client specified this is the system keeping me from doing um, what my code here is trying okay other questions all right so select loop I'm writing a select statement, and I say select blah, 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 into. Well, if that into statement says into table, and then lists an internal table, which is what we've been doing in the last few programs, the result gets put into an internal table in a single step operation called an array fetch. So if I want to go out and fill up my internal table with data from a database table, this is what I'm going to be doing. And this is what we are doing in, in this program right here, where you'll notice my into clause says into table. One of the most common mistakes to make is to want to put something in an in, into an internal table and forget the word table and just typing into and then the name of your internal table. Got to have that keyword table there for the reason that this slide explains. If we are not putting it into a table, if the into clause does not say into table, then we're not going to get a single step array fetch. We are going to get an iterative retrieval of what's in the database table. So if I say into table, and this is the database mm -hmm. table out here, the system goes out, grabs this whole thing, and in one operation moves it to my internal table. If I don't specify into table, then my select statement is going to go out and grab one record and put us into a looping condition. And in that loop, it will allow me to iteratively step through everything that is being retrieved by that select statement. So let's look at the syntax for this. Select carrot conid city from city to from sp fly into 
no keyword table. So there is no internal table in this source code at all. So what is this? This is a work area. This is a single record from my database table. And then I write this out. And then my end select statement causes the system to go back up. And it's going to grab the next row of the result set. And we're going to iterate through writing output. So I've done a couple things here. I have eliminated the use of an internal table at all. So there's no internal table, which means that on the application layer, I have not retrieved a huge block of data to be stored, and I have not moved it all in, in one fetch operation. Instead, I'm going out and pulling singular records from the database one at a time. What, apart from the fact that we're not creating an internal table, what else does this imply about the nature of the running of this program? <clears throat> it take longer. It may or may not take longer, but why do you think it would take longer? Because you're not getting it as one big chunk, you're getting it iterated. Okay, which is causing what to have to do more work? Okay, but think about, you, you're giving good answers, so I want to keep with that. What layer of our three-layer architecture is having to do more work here? Application. Close. Data, the database layer is now, you know, it's kind of like if you were playing the role of database, and I said, give me the table, you know, you'd wander through your memory, find it, turn around and hand me the table, the contents, and you're done. Here, it's like I'm saying, okay, I want that box of stuff over there, but bring it to me one piece at a time. And you're having to go and fetch and give it to me, go and fetch and give it to me, and do that iteratively. So we're changing the control flow. So we do have to be kind of mindful here of that, of that trade-off. Now, the reality is that a lot of this has changed thanks to SAP HANA. The rule of thumb in ABAP development used to be don't ask the database to do too much. Because if you overtax the database, your system's going to bog down. Because database performance is one of the general bottlenecks of the system. But now, with SAP HANA and other in-memory database systems, the performance of the database is actually one of the fastest parts of the system. So now the rule of thumb is, it's okay to ask the database to do work for you. You know, the rule of thumb used to be, keep your select statements really, really, really generic. And don't ask the database to do anything super specific. Do the heavy lifting in your program. So for example, if we wanted to do some um, very, very sophisticated manipulation on the data. We might go into the database and retrieve 500 records, and then in the logic of our program, whittle that down to just the 300 that we need. And we would do that whittling down and that evaluation of records in our ABAP program so as not to ask too much of the database. Now the rule of thumb is get as much as you can in your database query so that you have to do very little in your program because the databases now are just so fast. As I have talked to um, developers and people who lead ABOP development teams, one of the things that they have told me is that with the newer database systems, what has happened now is what they are really looking for in developers is really, really strong database skills and being able to write very sophisticated database queries that will have the database layer doing a lot of the filtering, a lot of the sorting, and a lot of the manipulation that used to be done in the application layer. Because where you really get your performance improvements now is by forcing as much as you can onto the database layer. And so in that situation, this, whereas before we might have frowned on it, 
now you're starting to see more and more code like this come back into use. What this is doing, however, is if you think of this like a telephone call, if I do the array fetch, I make one call, I say give me the data, I get the data back, I hang up the phone, and this right here, I'm keeping my connection to the database open throughout the entire body of this select loop. So I don't want to have a lot here in this select loop and keep that database connection open any longer than I have to. So this is an alternate way for me to pull things out of a database table and manipulate them in, in my program. Any questions about this? The write statement doesn't match up with the select statement. Is that intentional or did I? Um, in what respect does it not match up? I don't, I have carrot, carrot, conid, conid, city from, city from, city to, city to. I, I think it matches up, but oh, am okay. I missing I something? The light and the two is yeah, the these, are, these are literal strings here, yeah. is why. And so that's what I'm, I'm illustrating here is just being different in this output. Yes, sir? Can you do some sort of edit statement within this? You mean, can I, um, could I change this record that I have in my hands? Uh, yeah, or could you like manipulate the internal table with this? Well, there is no internal table, oh, okay. but could I manipulate the database table? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I could step through here and in the body of this have maybe an update mm -hmm. statement, which we haven't gotten to yet, or even a delete statement. So yeah. And that's not an atypical thing to see have happen here. We're just doing a lot right now with creating output, but you absolutely can do other kinds of processing in there. Common mistakes I make is either forgetting the word table when table should be there, and when I'm doing a select loop, forgetting the end select statement. And the nice thing is a lot of times when I forget to put the into table, the way I catch that is when I go to uh, syntax check my code, it'll say missing end select. And when I see missing end select, I know, oh, I didn't mean a select loop. And I go back and put the missing word table in. So this was option two. We could fetch into, a data, into an internal table. We could fetch iteratively into what I'll call, continue to call a work area. Or I can actually fetch into individual data objects. So let me show it to you um, by way of the syntax and then we'll look at an actual program. So notice here now, I don't have into table, but what I do have is after the word into, I have an open and closing parentheses with a set of variables listed. And so based on this, given that I'm writing into two variables here, I must actually have specified two fields here in my select statement. So the third option is not to use an internal table, not to use a work area, but just to go into individual discrete variables, if you will. If I want to do this with my new inline syntax, here's what the code looks like. Select mont caret conid from spfly put client specified there, um, and there's a typo here. This should be, should be data mons, not data client. Um, so here, I'm retrieving the client number, the carrier ID, and the connection ID. But for some reason, just to illustrate this, I didn't even want to put this in a work area. What's going to happen is mons going to go into, and let me fix this, mons. And data is going to go into carrot, and the other one is going to go into conid. Now, now just to um, make this a little bit more easy example for you to see, I'm going to do this. Var1, var2, var3, and then change this to var1. Var2, because I don't want you in any way to think that the names here are, are the reason why this works. What's happening here is it's, it's going to go out and it's going to pull 
those three pieces of data, and then it's just going to stuff them into these variables working from left to right. So the first one it fetched is going into bar one, the second one it fetched is going into bar two, the third one it fetched is going into bar three, and then I'm just going to write this out. And this is a select loop. The only time we don't get the loop is when this says into table. So I have three different ways of structuring my select statement. Select into table, which puts it into an internal table. Select into and specify the equivalent of a work area, and then it will iterate across that work area. Or select into, and then in parentheses put the name of an individual data object. There's only one situation where I ever use this. Can anybody think of a situation that actually makes sense to do this? Because right now, the way this code is written, it looks to me like I could have just used a, a dynamically created work area. So why would I ever want to not use a dynamically created work area? Anybody think of an example? If you didn't have to um, manipulate, if you're, if you're just reading, Okay, if I, that's definitely true. That's a part of it. What I would suggest to you is, is, let's say, for example, I only wanted to know what city we had flights going from. So I'm only interested in pulling out one field. So to put one field into an internal table is kind of overkill. And even to put one field into a structure is kind of overkill. So here, I think it does make perfect sense to do into and, and get rid of the table. So we're not going to have the table there. And here, um, have this be an individual data item. Into data. I got to make sure I get my syntax here right because we pick up the parenthesis here. So into at data, and I'll just call this city. Make sure I have an appropriate number of parentheses there. And so now um, I don't need my loop at structure because I have a select loop here. By the way, here's another good example. I'll leave this here the way it's written and we could observe why this is, is, is an issue. And then I'll just do write on a new line city. And it's no longer end loop. This is now end select. Save, activate. So now I'm just looking at the different cities we fly to. I, I could change my select statement up to make this a select of unique records so that we don't get multiple things there. But the other thing that I kind of messed up here on purpose is you would not want to put the outputting of DB count inside of the loop. Otherwise, every time you loop through, you essentially now have turned it into like a, an index counter. So what I might want to do here is at the end of this, then write out something that would say this is how many records you actually um, retrieved. And so here I output the cities, and now the number 46 is at the bottom. Questions about any of this? You will definitely get a chance to work with the select statement in your next homework assignment, and we will use it quite a lot. And if you go into ABOP development, you will do a lot of database interaction because it is among the most uh, common things for ABOP developers to, to be involved in. So any, any questions about this before we go on to our next statement? Did you have to loop through all 46 um, of those elements? Could you loop through 23 of them? Backwards? If I used I'm going to get back whatever my select statement specified. So um, I have not shown you all of the variants on the select statement. Um, there are a lot of them. There are, you know, I could, for example, say 
just give me the first 10 records or give me the last 10 records or, you know, give me the cities that start with the letter N. But all of those limitations are going to come from the syntax of my select statement. And so whatever the select statement gives me back, I'm iterating through every one of them. And so, um, you know, we will talk more about the select statement as the semester goes on, but you can see um, <laughs> there's a lot of different syntax here. Notice one of them to relate to your questions are up to n rows. You know, if I just wanted the first five rows, I just add up to five rows in my select statement. It would give me the first five. Notice here, um, keyword distinct comes, um, looks like before the star. So just to show you that, so I could do here, select distinct, ignore my caps locks key not being engaged, see if that is in fact, that does appear to be the right syntax, and so here now is the distinct list of cities. So it's all about the structure of my select statement. I'm going to blast through everything that that select statement in fact returns. Good question. And so you'll become acquainted with some of this. And notice some of this we've talked about client specified. We obviously have not yet talked about different kinds of joins. Um, some of this should look very familiar to you, though, from um, database classes you've, you've taken. Okay. All right, so insert statement. We don't really talk as much about some of the other ones as we do the select statement. Um, the syntax for my insert statement I can do this three different ways. I can insert into name of the database table, keyword values, and feed it a work area. So in this situation, I can load up a work area with a new flight number, a new city from, a new city to, populate the work area with the date I want in the table, and then issue the command insert into SP fly values WA. The other alternative is, I can say insert, get rid of the word into, and change the word values to from. Okay, just syn what's the word? Uh, syntax that are synonyms for each other. Those first two lines are exactly the same thing. But if you use into, you have to say values. If you don't use into, use the keyword from. I don't care which of those you use you know, probably just get used to one of them and incorporate that into your repertoire. But the third of these is a little bit different. I can actually populate an internal table with multiple records of information and then insert that into the database into kind of, we don't call it this, but it's kind of like the opposite of an array fetch where I send the database table a whole internal table and say, hey, insert this into your database table. So here the syntax is insert database table from table, internal table. And the observation I'll make is nine times out of 10, when you're doing something with the database that involves an internal table, in your statement, the word table is going to appear before the name of the internal table. And this can get tricky. You know, in your program, sometimes you have to think, okay, which of these is the database table, which of these is the internal table, and, and not get things backwards because it's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot. Yes, sir? Is the inserting into the database table similar to the in, internal table, table in that appending for uh, um, standard is the same as insert? or is there an append? Um, there is an append, but it operates the same as the insert because of exactly what you just observed. Uh, in a database table, database tables are not inherently sorted. So when I insert, it's gonna wind up putting it at the end of the database table, which is fundamentally what an append does. But I do think there is syntax that does use the word append, but there's no reason to you know, use it if you can use insert. There are, I haven't shown you this in a lot of programs so far, but we do want to remember uh, checking sy-subrc. If I do an insert statement, I check sy-subrc and it's zero, then life is good. 
if I get back a 4, then that tells me that I could not do the insert because um, the insert would have violated the database integrity. You know, remember, we do have the concept of database keys. And so maybe, bless you, one of the records you were trying to put in violates that key because you can't put in another person with the same social security number as, as someone that's already there. So let's talk about the rules related to that. If I'm doing the from table example, if even one line of the internal table cannot be inserted due to duplicate key, the entire operation is aborted. So if I have 20 records loaded up in an internal table and I say insert this into the database table and it starts working on it and it hits even one record that it can't put in, it's going to trigger this error condition and none of my inserts are going to happen. It's going to roll back everything that it was in the midst of working on, whether it hit that on the first row or it hit that in the last row. If you want all the valid rows to be inserted, then you can add to the syntax here accepting duplicate keys. Now, that makes it sound like it's going to put a duplicate record in your database. It will not. It will still, it will essentially throw away the bad record. And here's the fun thing about that. You don't know which one it threw away. So if you gave it 20 records in an internal table and said, put this in the database table accepting duplicate keys, it would go through and, and if there were two or three bad records, it would just say, oh, I can't put that in, chuck, and it would just move on to the next one. Now, if you think about it, there are times when this might be desirable because maybe what you're doing is you have a set of information about people. And you know that some of those people are already in your database, but some of them are not. So what you want to do is for the ones that aren't there, you want to put them in. And for the ones that are there, you just want to ignore it. So you, this might actually be something that you would find utility for from time to time. But far and away, you would probably not want to handle it in, in this fashion. And, and this right here, you know, accepting duplicate keys, what I don't like is, as I said, it makes it seem like it's going to put a duplicate key in your database, and it's not. All that's saying is accept duplicate keys as being a part of my data set and, and let that be okay, process the ones that aren't duplicate. Kind of an oddity there in the syntax. Yes, sir? So uh, when you get that error, uh, does it give you any, uh, is there any way to get more information, for example, like what was the record that was a duplicate in order to like do some debugging on that data? No. You're going to have to figure it out somehow in the logic of your program. And so that's what this says right here. Duplicate rows are skipped, other rows are inserted. SY-SUB is going to be set to 4, so you know that an error happened. And SYDB count is going to be set to the number of rows successfully inserted. So if you fed in an internal table with 20 records, and you got a result of SY-SUBRC being 4, and SYDB count is now set to 15, you know that five of your records weren't processed, and you have no idea which ones. Which is why, well, let me just say, there are different ways you could do this. What you could do is if you can imagine the logic of a program, you could kind of have a, a fallback position where you could say, okay, here's my internal table. It's got a whole bunch of stuff in it. Let's insert it into the internal table, not doing the accept duplicate keys. Let's insert it into the table and see if I get back success. If I get back success, yay, I'm done. But if I try and insert my whole internal table and I get back SY-SUBRC equals 4, then I know at least one of my rows is bad. So then I can have as the next part of my program step through the internal table, loop at internal table, and use the syntax to put the records in one at a time. And then I'll know which goes in and which don't go in. 
And that's not an unusual, you know, it's kind of one of these, you know, let's cross my fingers and hope they all go in in one shot, but then write my program so that if they don't, I have a fallback position and I can, I can go through them one at a time. So this gives us the, the ability to handle it in, in that fashion. And when it says it rolls back the, op the operation, the operation being that particular insert statement, not the entire program that may have started before that. That's correct. We will talk eventually about logical units of work and controlling rollbacks explicitly. But in this case, what is going to be rolled back is just that insert statement, not anything that might have preceded it. Very good point. And, oh, last point at the bottom of the slide here, but not in any way unimportant. Okay, so might be our last point for the day. I don't know, but I can tell you, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to give you your homework assignment. Well, what I'll do is I'm going to give you your homework assignment after class today, but since we still need to talk more about some stuff on Monday, um, I'll just give you longer to get it done. Okay, but this way you can get started on it if you want to, because there are some things you can do. So let's say I have a database table, and in my database table, I have a field called ID. And the database type is called, um, you know, what are we doing? Um, our logins are ZN001 ID type, okay? That's a, a custom user defined data type that's in the ABOP dictionary. So I change that back and I look in the ABOP dictionary and I see that ZN001 ID type relates to a data domain. And that data domain is called ZN001 ID domain. So I go and look at the ID domain. And ID domain tells me that ID numbers are six digits and they range from 10,000 to 99,999. Okay? So that's in my database definition. Everything here we've talked about how to do. Okay? Let me clean up my whiteboard scrawl here. So, I build a record to put a new person into this database table. And this database table just has an ID number, a first name, and a last name. And so over here, I have a record. ID number, first name, last name. And in this, I have an ID number 675, first name Bob, last name Johnson. I go to insert that into my database table. Look at the last line of my slide. Database domain restrictions are not enforced on programmatic data insertion. This will go into this table just fine. So, how do I protect myself in this situation? Well, let's assume that this ID came from me displaying to the user a form on the field, on the, on the input field, and asking them to type a value in here. Remember, if in my parameter statement I use value check, then that will check the user's input against the domain data and make sure that 675 doesn't make it past that. But what I'm telling you is if I do have that data get into an insert statement, the system is not going to block it from going into the database. So we have to make sure that the logic of our program enforces the data domains. Excellent place to shoot yourself in the foot. And I suspect the whole reason why it does not do checking on data insertion is this would be incredibly um, what's the word I'm looking for? This would require a, a lot of system resources. 
if every time it did an insert, it had to check every piece of data to make sure it conforms with the domain data. So it forces that job onto us as the, as the developer. Any questions about any of this? Let me look and see what I have as my next slide. Okay, my next slide is about the update statement, but let me do this instead. Let's look at what I'm going to put out there as your next homework assignment, and let's talk about it for a few minutes. And probably what I will do is have this homework assignment be due Friday of next week, okay? Because I'm quite sure that by end of class on Monday, we'll know everything we can do. But this is a big homework assignment, so you might want to start on it now. So let's just look at it together. Task one, create a database table capable of storing facts about people's birthdays. Use data domains as necessary to achieve specified data constraints. Your database table should store the following information on people. Their first name, by the way, the implication here is these are six different fields. First name, last name, month of birth, where the month is represented as a three-letter abbreviation, Jan, Feb, Mar, etc. Their day of birth, their year of birth, and the friend number. Okay, it's considered best practices to insert a month field. Use data domains as necessary to constrain values for items two through six above. <laughs> and I don't know why I put two there. Um, my my intent was for that to say three through six. So I'll try and up, remember to update that before I upload this to D2L. Friend numbers to be part of the key. This is a four-digit number with values as you see here. Um, you are storing birthdays for people alive as of this year. So in defining your domain related to date of birth, you know, 1776 would not be a valid birthday because that person probably is not alive today. All right, so task one is to create this database table, which implies creating data types and creating domains. That's a pretty good job right there that, that you should know how to do at this point. Then you're going to write a whole bunch of programs, but none of them are going to be very long. Program one, write a program that adds four friends to this table. The date on these friends should be hard-coded within the program. So there's no user input here at all. This program will just populate your database table with four friends. Program's non-interactive and shows the results, X records added to the database table. So based on what we've done today, you could do program one now as well. Program two, create a program which clears all data from the database table. This is not going to be a long program, okay? But um, we haven't talked about this yet, but you could probably look in your textbook or look ahead in your notes and you could probably figure out how to write program number two. Program number three, create a program which allows a user to interactively add a new person to the database table. Program should allow the user to enter values for all six fields, um, you know, give them a, a nice set of fields in the parameter statement to put that in and then do whatever you need to do to make sure they got gave you good data and then put that into the database table okay that's program four or program three and then program four create a program which displays on the screen all of the data from the database table and just dump it to the screen and a nice display so we have not talked about all of these things but we have talked about most of them. And so this might be something, well, I would just encourage you to start work on it because particularly task one may take a little while to work through all of the things associated with that. With your programs, the one thing I want to emphasize is I will be looking to make sure that after you do your interaction with the database that you're checking appropriately, SY-SUBRC. So for example, if the user types in someone they want to add to the database and it's a friend number that already exists, the database is not going to let you put that in there because that would be a key violation. So make sure your program 
display something that basically says could not put friend in or something of that sort. So make sure you're checking those things. So this will be uh, your next homework assignment. So I'll put it out in D2L, but at the moment I'm not ready to specify a due date, but I'm inclined to think that the due date will probably be um, March 30th. Okay. Any questions? All right. Yes, sir. Um, three more uh, assignments do you plan on to make? I envision there being at least three more okay. required assignments and then probably uh, at, at least one, if not two, optional assignments. Um, and don't, you know, when I said three, it's at least three. You may have actually four or five. I just, it depends on how I break it up, you know. Okay. So. Um, I did. I don't know where it is, but if you did not sign in, make sure that you do so. And I'll look forward to seeing you guys next week. Yes, ma'am.